Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 85, I think it is, of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. As always, comments, questions, reactions, whatever, send them to me at whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Uh, and my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around here a couple of times during the show. And uh, if you didn't catch the email, you can get it at the website. If you send me email, uh, please include something like left side of the aisle or your subject line or LSOTA, something like that, so you know it's not spam. Okay, with those uh, tr now traditional introductions out of the way, let me get to it. Now this week, going to be a little bit different. I had so many things that upset me this week, so many things that infuriated me for one way, or, uh, one reason or another, that I couldn't pick an outrage of the week. So I have six. This is an all outrage show. So we're going to start right in with outrage of the week, part one. Do you remember the Deepwater Horizon? Uh, this is the rig. This is, this is the rig that uh, blew out in uh, 2010, killing 11 workers and spilling an as, as still undetermined amount of oil into the Gulf of Mexico, fouling the Gulf and the entire Gulf Coast from, from Louisiana to the Florida Panhandle. Well, a couple of weeks ago, there was an announcement about the settlement that had been reached between BP, which was the outfit responsible for the, uh, for the, uh, the rig, and the Department of Justice. As part of this settlement, we were loudly told, BP pled guilty to 14 uh, criminal charges, including, we were loudly told, uh, 11 charges of manslaughter for the deaths of the workers uh, and one of obstruction of justice for lying to Congress about how much oil was spilling out. The company was hit with, we were loudly told, record criminal penalties of $1.3 billion in fines, plus another $2.7 billion to be in fines to be paid to various federal agencies. And we were loudly told, another $525 million to the Securities and Exchange Commission to settle outstanding securities charges. We were loudly told all of that, and all of that is true. This is the part that they whispered. The total fines of $4.5 billion are to be paid out over five years, or in other words, at about $900 million a year. This is the part they didn't say at all. In 2011, BP recorded revenue of over $234 billion with net income, that is profit, of $16 billion. The total fine for 14 felony counts could be paid all at once with one week, one week's earnings from that one year. In fact, you could pay the total amount with less than 15 weeks profit from that one year. And since it's to be paid out over five years, we're talking about something less than two days income per year or less than three weeks profit per year. And if I consider that in its most recent quarter, this is the one that ended September 30th, BP netted, profited $5.4 billion, a billion dollars more in profit in that one quarter than the entire fine. Now, BP still faces the possibility of other fines from the federal government under, for example, the Clean Water Act. They still face uh, civil suits from private individuals. And in what might be the most unusual aspect of this whole thing, four lower-level executives are actually facing criminal charges as individuals. But the thing is, look what we've got here. Remember, corporations are people. Remember that? That's what the Supreme Court told us in uh, Citizens United. Corporations are people, my friend. So for legal purposes, corporations are people. They are legal persons. So what we have here is this legal person pleading guilty to 14 felonies, including 11 counts of manslaughter, and their total fine, their total penalty, is a fine equal to one week's wages. This, we were loudly told by some, was fair and appropriate. I say it's a moral outrage. All right, moving on from there to outrage of the week. Chapter 2. Um, 
something over 190 nations actually have now have representatives at the UN Climate Summit that's taking place in Doha, uh, which is the capital of Qatar. Um, with that in mind, here are some late news bits on global warming. Start, as always, with the fact that it's all but universally agreed that to head off the worst effects of global warming, we have to keep the average increase in global temperatures to something below 2 degrees Celsius, or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. To get above that, and you start seeing accelerated effects, uh, not only the immediate effects, but you also see long-term impacts. You see acceleration of the melting of ice caps in the Greenland ice sheet. Now, they're already melting, but this would dramatically increase the rate at which they're melting. And if those melt, you're talking about sea level rises of several feet. Uh, also, by the way, this would lead to a drop in the Earth's albedo, the loss of this ice cover. Albedo is a measure of the reflectivity of a surface. In other words, the Earth would reflect less sunlight than it does, which of course means more sunlight is absorbed, which means more warming. Okay, so start with that two degree limit, okay? Start there. According to the latest report from the UN's Environment, Pro uh, Environment Program, uh, this involved 55 scientists from 22 countries and it came out just a couple of weeks ago. According to that latest report, uh, in 2020, greenhouse gas emissions, and greenhouse gases, again, are the ones that contribute to global warming by limiting the ability of the heat to radiate out into space. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions could be between eight and 13 billion tons above the level needed to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius. What's more, the gap, this is based on what countries currently pledge to do to cut their own emissions. And in fact, based on that pledge uh, and what's needed to stay below the two degrees Celsius limit, the gap is bigger than it was a year ago. Last year they said it was six to 11 billion tons. What's more, that 8 billion ton limit, that lower limit, that is, in the words of the report, I'm quoting, this is even if the most ambitious level of pledges and commitments were implemented by all countries and under the strictest set of rules. In other words, based on what countries are promising to do, that is as good as it gets. Meanwhile, another report, this, this one from the World Bank about two weeks ago, predicted the world is likely to warm between three and four degrees Celsius by the end of the century. Extreme weather events, such as Hurricane Sandy, will become the new normal and affect all parts of the world. A third report, this one published just this past week in the peer-reviewed journal Nature Climate Change, says it appears inevitable the world will not only hit that two degrees Celsius mark, it will zoom right past it to as much as four to six degrees by the end of the century, and that would be disastrous. A uh, November report for the International Energy Agency found that if greenhouse gas emissions are not significantly cut by 2017, existing power plants, factories, and buildings would be enough to push the world past the two degrees Celsius mark. And finally, the accounting firm uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers recently warned, due in the economics of it, said the only way the world can prevent the two degree rise is if the global economy cuts its carbon intensity by 5.1% per year. Don't worry about it, it's just a technical measure. The point is I have to do it every year between now and 2050. What that would mean is slamming the brakes on any growth in carbon output and maintaining that limit for the next 37 years. Nobody expects that to happen, nobody at all. Especially since even if the current round of talks were by some miracle to produce strict and enforceable limits, the treaty wouldn't take effect until 2020, which means countries conti could continue to increase their, their emissions for the next eight years. Okay, that's where we are. That's what we face. That's the hurdle we have to overcome if we are not to leave our children and even more our grandchildren a damaged, maybe destroyed environment. All right, so what's the outrage here? It's our role as Americans. Put that into perspective, okay? Uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from the nations of the European Union are actually down 18% since 1990, which proves this can be done. Emissions in the US were up 11% in that same period. China is now the world's largest producer of greenhouse gases, largely because it just has so many people. But on a per person basis, China's output is about 6.6 .6 tons of greenhouse gas per person, per, uh, per person, 
uh, compared to the European Union, which is about 7.3, compared to the United States, which is 17.2, more than double the European Union, two and a half times China. So what's our government doing at this Doha meeting? What's the government saying? What's the word from the delegation sent there by Barack Obama who makes claims of his deep concern about global warming? We're bragging about a, what a great job we're doing and saying that China and India are the ones who need to act. We are supposedly on track to meet our own self-imposed target of cutting greenhouse uh, gas emissions 17% below 2005 levels by 2020. Thing is, 2005 levels were already much above uh, those of earlier years, and Obama's target only cuts U.S. emissions to about three or four percent below 1990 levels. But five years ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, this is the expert group on climate change. These five years ago, they said that the rich nations of the world needed to cut their emissions by 25 to 40 percent below 1990 levels by 2020 if we're to head off the most damaging effects of global warming. We are nowhere near that, and we're not even trying to be anywhere near that. In fact, about the only nations that are anywhere near that are, again, the nations of the European Union. Again, their emissions are down 18 percent since, uh, um, since 1990, and it's, they've got a good shot at getting to like 25% by 2020, which is the low end of that range, but at least it's in the range. Now, one way the Europ European Union has tried to uh, increase its carbon awareness to further cut its emissions, it imposed a requirement that all commercial flights within the European Union must pay a fee based on the carbon emissions of the flight which is a clear financial incentive for the airlines to find ways to cut their carbon emissions. Recently, the European Union wanted to expand that to include all flights into or out of the European Union. I mean, like, you know, from the United States to Germany or from Britain to the United States or whatever. So what did Barack, I'm so concerned about global warming, do? He signed a bill passed by Congress exempting U.S. airlines from having to pay the fee. Bluntly, what they're saying is that U.S. corporations do not have to follow European laws even in Europe. Now, leaving aside the astonishing imperial arrogance here, there is the matter of the hypocrisy on global warming, emphasized by the fact that the U.S. said this needs to be solved through negotiations at the International Civil Aviation Organization. Even though, shades of Israel and the Palestinians, the, U the European Union only acted after 10 years of negotiations there got absolutely nowhere. Meanwhile, domestically, Obama remains closed mouth on the Keystone XL pipeline. This is a pros uh, proposed pipeline which would bring tar sands from Canada into Texas for refining. Now, I talked about this before. Tar sands are about the dirtiest, foulest, most climate damaging way of producing uh, usable oil there is. In, the tw in 2010, the EPA calculated that getting oil uh, on a, on a uh, uh, well-to-tank basis, getting oil from tar sands produces nearly twice as much greenhouse gases as conventional oil. Now, the White House, in this case, booted a decision on the pipeline until after the election because he didn't want to have to deal with it during the campaign. But the fact that this is still on the table shows how frail this supposed commitment to battling climate change really is. All right, meanwhile, in November, two companies got a green light from the feds to begin pulling tar sands out of sites in Utah. And plans are to expand this to more sites in Utah with an estimated 32 billion barrels of oil in tar sands. Now, does that sound like a lot of oil? It's not. The world currently consumes about 36 billion barrels of oil a year. So this would rip up the environment and massively increase, uh, increase the production of greenhouse gases for less than one year's world oil consumption. And this, it appears, is fine with our oh-so-concerned administration. Oh, and by the way, remember, the XL pipeline, the Keystone XL pipeline, crosses an international boundary. Because of that, the State Department has to sign off on whether or not this project is in the national interest. Well, guess who 
has major investments in the company extracting oil from the tar sands in Canada, uh, in uh, uh, um, investments in the company that's going to build and run the pipeline from Canada to the U.S., and in the Canadian banks that are financing this deal. Her, Susan Rice, our U.N. ambassador, who is everybody is predicting is going to be nominated to be Secretary of State and thereby be the one responsible for making the decision. As a footnote to all this, according to a poll by Yale and George Mason Universities, uh, uh, the portion of Americans who say that climate change will affect them a moderate amount or a great deal went from 29% to 42% between March and September of this year. And remember, that was before Sandy. As is often true, the people are in front of the politicians because they spend their time listening to the money bags who are behind them. And we are going to take a break. And we're back. Um, now, our next outrage of this special all outrage edition of Left Side of the Aisle. Um, I mentioned Hurricane Sandy in the last thing about global warming, so this is connects to that. That um, I mean, you know about Hurricane Sandy, although actually technically it was a tropical storm by the time it actually hit the mid-Atlantic states. But in fact, a few weeks ago, uh, some of you may recall that I talked about some of the devastation, which is a proper word in this case, some of the devastation along the Jersey Shore where, where I grew up. Well, one place that was hard hit was the Midland Beach section of Staten Island. A man there named uh, Amin Yosef, uh, a 42-year-old Syrian-American, that's him in the picture, he saw his house destroyed by the storm. But remarkably, instead of just being devastated by this, he used the site to establish a 24-7 community pop-up center. Over the next month, he was aided by hundreds of volunteers, both from the community and from organizations like Occupy Sandy, whose skill at on-the-fly organizing proved very valuable to the effort. That stretch of pavement in front of his home ultimately stretched to be half a block long. It was a hub to gather and provide food, cleaning supplies, clothing, medical supplies, blankets, whatever you needed, to the thousands of residents who were still without heat, power, or safe housing. Volunteers even uh, organized teams to go into some of the houses and rip out the moldy drywall uh, so they could, the people could start the process of rebuilding. This is at a time when FEMA, the Red Cross, and New York City officials were initially nowhere to be found on the island. It was pure, unadulterated citizen-to-citizen -citizen aid and was actually widely praised. The city wants it shut down. On November 30th, a representative of Mayor Bloomberg's office showed up at Yusuf's place and declared, we're moving you out because the relief center was blocking the sidewalk. In a creepy echo of the excuses used to shut down Occupy sites across the country, including in New York City, he said the site was unsafe. The actual number of reported injuries at the site is none. This official then ordered a Red Cross truck, which was delivering supplies to the neighborhood, to leave. Now, as of Monday, December 3rd, the hub was still there despite the official threats and pressure. Police had told the volunteers that they could stay if they didn't take up the whole sidewalk. So what they did is they moved their kitchen into a driveway and moved everything else three feet back from the curb. But that has not stopped the pressure. The sidewalk is no longer blocked. But the trailers used to deliver and store the goods and things that people need are being ticketed. Uh, and what's more, the sanitation canisters were removed. And this leads me to wonder something. Another way that was used to attack Occupy sites around the country was to say that they were unsafe and unsanitary. And now the city has removed the sanitation canisters. I wonder how long it's going to be before unsanitary now is added to the claims against this site. Volunteers at the site say that city agencies are telling them that the mayor's office is twisting their arms to get these people out of there. Now, the mayor's office says it's recommend, uh, recommending, and I love that. It's like, it's just a suggestion. You know, just a suggestion. They're recommending that the site be moved to an indoor location for safety reasons. And there are hubs around the city that are uh, indoors. So the volunteers say, fine, that's fine. Uh, we're perfectly willing to go indoors, but you've got to bear in mind 
This has got to be a place that must be adequate to the task, must be available for the short to long term, must be somewhere nearby so people can get to it, and it has to be free. So you tell us, where can we go? The city has no answer to this, which is not surprising because they don't want to have an answer. They just want this gone. And that is an outrage. All right, and moving on from there, we've got a PS to that outrage. After Hurricane Sandy, uh, a number of people in New York discovered that their mobile phone communications were, had been, were knocked out. They were out for days. And this at a time when being able to communicate with people was unusually important. Now, why did this happen? Five years ago, the FCC re uh, was responding to findings that the telecommunications companies had not provided adequate backup power. Uh, this is what Hurricane Katrina told them. So the F FCC moved to adopt rules requiring these companies to have adequate backup energy sources. The company sued, claiming the FCC did not have any authority over them. And uh, before that case could be resolved, the Shrub administration decided, ah, this is going to cost the companies too much, and the whole matter got dropped. So the telecoms had no backup power because they didn't have to have any backup power, and providing backup power costs money, reduces profits. And what's more, the FCC is not even allowed to ask the basis for or inquire about the consequences of that decision, even though about a third of the population now re relies exclusively on, on uh, wireless, on, on uh, mobile phones, for their voice communication. What's more, the telecommunications companies are now trying to claim a constitutional right to operate without any federal oversight. Verizon has sued in the uh, Court of Appeals for the for District of Columbia, arguing that neither the FCC nor even Congress has any authority over its networks. They're claiming that the First Amendment protects the company's editorial discretion. In other words, Verizon is saying it's just like a newspaper. Meanwhile, this is actually spreading beyond just wireless. Last week, AT&T filed a petition with the FCC seeking wholesale deregulation of its wires. That would exempt the company from all laws about consumer protection, competition, and universal access to affordable communications. And where can all this lead? Well, I think it's obvious, but here's a specific example right now. Apple has twice rejected an app that adds a location to a map every time a drone strike is reported in the media and added to a database maintained by the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, which is in the United Kingdom. It does that. It does nothing else. Just adds a point to a map. Apple says this app is objectionable and crude. What's really objectionable and crude here is that Apple, which has received over $9 million in military contracts over the past several years, has decided to censor political information. In fact, that's not just objectionable and crude. I'd call it dangerous and an outrage. All right, now moving on to something else, another outrage. I think it's the fifth outrage for the, for the week this special all-outrage edition of Left Side of the Aisle. A little history. In 1990, Congress passed and President Bush the Elder signed into law the Americans with Disabilities Act. This bill is not perfect, but among the nations of the world, the ADA is regarded as the gold standard for protection of the rights of the disabled. As such, it became the basis for a UN treaty on the rights of people with disabilities. This treaty was negotiated for the US by the administration of George Bush the Younger. It was completed in 2006, Obama signed it in 2009. This treaty has so far been ratified by 126 nations who are obligated under it to assure that the people with disabilities in their society enjoy the same rights and fundamental freedoms that all the other citizens do. That is, in other words, they're obligated to strive for what we are already striving for under the ADA, or more particularly, they are to strive for the standard that we set. This treaty would not affect U.S. law at all. Remember, our law is the standard for judgment. But it would be, approving it would be a strong signal that we expect other nations to take their obligations under that treaty seriously. 
Our only obligation would be to report every few years, as every nation would have to, uh, to give a report to a panel of disabilities experts who could make non-binding recommendations of how to further improve things. Okay, this treaty came up before the Senate this week with wide bipartisan backing. Supported by both Bushes, it was supported by Obama, it was supported by Bob Dole, who came to the House, uh, to the Senate floor rather in his wheelchair in order to show his support. On the floor, it was supported in debate by John Kerry, John McCain, Richard Lugar, Dick Durbin, and Tom Harkin. It was about as bipartisan as something can be in the Senate. It was backed by the disabilities community and by veterans groups. On Tuesday, December 4th, the Senate rejected the treaty. It got 61 votes, but a two-thirds vote, right now 66 votes, is required to ratify a treaty. The objections to the treaty were the usual blend of ignorance, stupidity, and paranoid wackoness about UN world government, complete with the whoop-whoop sound of flying black helicopters in the background. The 38 goppers who voted against this who voted no, they are a disgrace to their offices, they are a disgrace to the nation. John Kerry called this day one of the saddest days I've seen in almost 28 years in the Senate. I call it despicable and an outrage. All right, this is my last, my last thing, and uh, I have very little time for this. I'm not sure how much time I've got, but um, what have I got, about two minutes? Uh, no, I got more time than I thought I had. All right, then I'll talk slower. Uh, this is about the grand bargain to, avoid the fis uh, uh, bargain to avoid the fiscal cliff, which as I keep telling people, ain't grand, it ain't no bargain, and there ain't no cliff. In fact, some people say, well, it's not a cliff, it's more like a slope. Actually, it's more like stepping off a curb. And, and the thing is, in a way, it's hard to talk. I've been trying to talk about the grand bargain for the last couple of weeks, but in a way, it's kind of hard to do because it's all just posturing. There's nothing to grab onto. There's lots of talk and bloviating about tax revenues and entitlements and everyone's taking out positions they know the other side won't accept. It's all just for show. It's all kabuki theater, all stylized drama and makeup. There's nothing to grab onto to really comment on. So what needs to be noted here is actually not what's in the script, but what's not in the script. It's rather than saying, you know, there's no there there, this is more like, this is the there that should be there but isn't. First, is that there are not two sides here. There is one side. The cutting the defi deficit is the most important thing ever side. The side that takes as, as a point of faith that benefits to ordinary citizens must be cut. And the only dispute is just how much and just how deep and just how you do it, along with how small tax increases can be and still look like you're being tough on the rich. Outside the Beltway, the American people as a whole say they really don't care about the deficit. They're a lot more concerned about jobs and the economy. But here's the, here's the thing I really want to talk about today, the point I really wanted to make, the real outrage, or at least one of them in this business. In all the discussions about spending cuts going on now, there is no proposal, look at this graph, look at the top half of that graph. There is no proposal to take a single penny out of the top half of that chart. None. Nobody's talking about this. Nobody's talking about cutting defense spending. Nobody's talking about cutting military spending. Not one penny, it's not even being mentioned. And you tell me how that is not an outrage. All right, that's it. That's it for this week. There's other stuff that needs to be talked about. I want to talk about uh, Israel's reaction to the Palestinians' uh, upgrade at the United Nations, um, other important things to talk about, but those will have to wait till next week. But for now, you just have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week. And remember, whoviating at AOL.com and email me. Bye.